Is this, is this clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't think I need this then. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Dorothea, for the nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> so as, as Dorothea mentioned, I, um, before I came here, I'd done my, um, I had spent the previous eight years living mostly between uh, Hawaii, India, and Thailand. Uh, India and Thailand being my two, two um, research locations. And uh, it, was, it was actually quite a kind of a challenging transition, just culturally going through some culture shock, coming back to the mainland. But now, um, you know, having been in Colorado for nearly three years now, uh, a couple, a couple things I've noticed about the community. And these are things that are you know, fairly obvious to, to most of us. Uh, <clears throat> but what really struck out to me is that it's a very religious community, uh, both in terms of uh, its depth, the depth of people's uh, sincerity in practicing their religious traditions, uh, <clears throat> claiming to lead lives influenced by religious teachings and beliefs and so on, but also the, the breadth um, there's actually quite a bit of diversity in the community in, in Colorado in general, but also here in the Springs. Uh, there, there's a Muslim community, there are various Buddhist communities, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, there's a growing number of yoga communities, uh, a growing number of uh, yoga studios that are being set up, and just on the upper left-hand corner is just an uh, image of Core Power Yoga. This is their studio on, on Nevada. And, Inside there, you see a, a class that's taking, taking place. And so um, that's part of the reason why I decided to give this talk. I thought in some ways, you know, religion is a, is a relevant theme and part of people's lives here in Colorado Springs. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to, uh, through this, bring to light uh, some of the beliefs and practices of the yoga, if we can call it a religion, which is, which is debatable. Uh, but it certainly displays certain features that are common to different religions. Uh, but more than just uh, a presentation, you know, on on the ins and outs of yoga, religion, and philosophy, to explore uh, some of the arguments, uh, <clears throat> some of the arguments, and do some conceptual analysis uh, of, or for the concepts that underlie yoga as a religion and as a philosophy. Uh, my training is certainly much more in philosophy than it is religion. Um, so I'll be focusing more on that. Um, now, along the way, I'll also be making some comparative references between the yoga tradition and also the Christian tradition. And on the right there, I believe that's New Life Church and uh, an image of the, a congregation there at New Life, I believe. And I'd like to point out that both Christianity and yoga, these are two, these are imports to Colorado. One, of course, is much more recent than the other, and had, its membership is much, uh, it's not as strong. But nonetheless, these are both imports to Colorado. And um, as I draw comparisons between these two traditions, of all people, the thinker that I'll be uh, looking at the most, uh, the philosopher I'll be focusing on the most, is uh, someone who loved religion an awful lot, not really, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. So, uh, <clears throat> setting the stage for the philosophical discussion, let's kind of let's lay out a couple key concepts and beliefs on the on the yoga side of things. In in Hinduism generally, <clears throat> there is a belief in what's called an avatar, and an, or in Sanskrit pronounced avatara, and may, maybe you've seen the movie Avatar, and it's based on this concept, this Sanskrit term avatara. And quite literally, the term just means deliberate descent of a deity. Uh, it derives from the verb trit, which means to turn, and ava, which means to descent. So it's kind of a, a turning downwards of the deity. And typically in the Hindu tradition, this deity who descends, who takes human incarnate form, is Vishnu. And uh, <clears throat> we see Vishnu uh, in his own form in the center there, and he's riding a uh, kind of man bird, half man, half eagle. And this is called a Garuda. Uh, may, maybe some of you, or certainly I have, have flown Garuda Airlines. It's an airline in, in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> and uh, of the forms that Vishnu takes, of the various avatars he takes, 
we have on the top left, we have a boar named Varaha, and he incarnates as the boar because earth has been captured by a demon, and so the boar swims down to the bottom of the ocean, he defeats the demon, and he rescues the earth, he brings it back up to the surface. Uh, the second incarnation, or another incarnation, is Matsya. Uh, Matsya is just to the bottom right of Varaha the boar. Matsya is half fish, so you can see that fish there, it's next to the Jesus image there, and then the blue figure coming out, right? So it's always, it's always at least half, uh, or at least usually half man. And Matsya uh, himself, he, uh, he rescues the first man called Manu from a flood, and then Manu goes and establishes uh, the Indian nation. Another is Kurma. Kurma is, uh, is the turtle here, or the tortoise, just to the right of Vishnu, and very interesting character. He bears the weight of, of a mountain on its back so that the gods and the demons can <clears throat> wrap this snake around this mountain peak so they can rotate it very quickly and churn the oceans in order to kind of churn up what's called Soma, this elixir of immortality, right? So there's various other um, <clears throat> incarnate forms. It's not always human that Vishnu takes. Uh, we have a, a dwarf uh, to the top right of Vishnu. We have King Rama in the top right there, and King Rama is very popular in India. He's kind of the, the prototypical, you know, unfailing moral hero. Uh, we have Narayana just to the right of the boar. Uh, we have Buddha in the bottom left, the Hindu tradition. In some ways, overcomes. Oh, thank you. In some ways, that the Hindu tradition overcomes Buddhism, which was a great rival to Hinduism. It overcomes Buddhism by incorporating it and saying that Buddha is really just an incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, we have Krishna with his flute there on the right. And we'll talk a lot about Krishna, and then many others in the Hindu tradition. In the Hindu tradition, have included uh, Jesus Christ as an avatar of Vishnu. And what all of these avatars have in common is that in each instance, okay, there's classically recognized to be nine, if you include Jesus, that would be ten. In each instance, Jesus, I'm sorry, Vishnu descends and takes human incarnate form because the world has fallen into disarray. And so uh, it was very often his role to, to rescue the world in some sense. And oftentimes that involves reestablishing the moral order, the term for which in Sanskrit is dharma. So we'll be talking a lot about dharma in this presentation. And Vishnu is, of course, a very popular god, as are his incarnations. And there's many temples built uh, in devotion to Vishnu. Uh, the one just above Vishnu is in South India. It's a, just quite a monument. The bottom, uh, just below Vishnu, is Angkor Wat. It's the main temple at the Angkor Wat complex in uh, Cambodia. And then in the bottom right, this is a Hare Krishna temple right up the road in Denver. Okay, so <clears throat> the presence of, of these beliefs and practices associated with this tradition, the Hindu tradition and yoga specifically, are in our midst. So why don't we spend a little bit of time kind of clarifying some of the things they believe, and then again, in a short bit, we'll do some philosophical analysis of some of the ambiguous claims that are made in some Hindu and yoga texts. So. <clears throat> The text that I'm going to focus on is called the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita is part of the fifth chapter of this massive uh, Indian epic poem called the Mahabharata. And <clears throat> two central characters in the Mahabharata are in the top right, uh, the prince Arjuna, and in the bottom right, his best friend Krishna. Okay. And by the way, this blue skin is a sign of divinity, so if you, if you see characters for example, in the top right, uh, Brahma or Matsya, the fish, right? They have that kind of dark blue skin, right? It's a symbol of divinity. And in the course of the Mahabharata, Arjuna becomes more and more aware that his close friend Krishna is an incarnation of the god Vishnu himself, okay? But it's something that uh, steadily discloses itself through, throughout the epic, okay? The Gita occurs just in chapter five, so relatively early on in the epic. Now, throughout the epic, Arjuna is, he is the prototypical hero. He's morally unfailing, he's handsome, he's even got a nice mustache, right? Um, <clears throat> he's strong, he's the most powerful archer 
in all of India at the time. Okay? And he never shies away from battle. Uh, as you can see from this quote here from uh, book two of the Mahabharata. Nothing equals power, but bravery delights me. What use is a baron or a warrior, kshatri as a Sanskrit term, what use is a baron born in a heroic lineage who does not show his prowess? A baron's living is always conquest. All virtues indeed have their being in power. Okay, so he is kind of, again, the, the typical warrior hero prince, okay? But we find a very different Arjuna when we get to the Gita, okay? This is three books later. The setting for the Gita, in brief, is this, <clears throat> that Arjuna and his four brothers are pitted uh, in a civil war, okay? And there's a number of events that lead up to this civil war. Uh, many arguments have been brought against the Gita as being a text that condones or at least uh, allows for, for war to be something that uh, takes place uh, under the umbrella of religious you know, practices. But there's an argument to be made that Arjuna and his brothers have done up to this point everything conceivable to avoid war. <clears throat> so let's just assume that a war is inevitable. And Arjuna being the most powerful amongst his brothers, it's his duty to go out to the middle of the battlefield with Krishna as his charioteer. So you can see Krishna there with the, kind of the halo around his head and the blue face there. And he's leading Arjuna's chariot. And Arjuna is to blow this conch, which is going to then kick off the war. <clears throat> But as they're riding out and they get settled between these two massive armies preparing to destroy themselves, Arjuna, right, this proud and powerful warrior, warrior has this sudden realization and, and a change of heart. He says, for those whose sake kingdom and enjoyments and pleasures we desire are entering the fight, relinquishing their lives and riches. I see teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, fathers-in-law, brothers-in-law, and so on. <clears throat> but I desire neither victory, nor kingdom, nor even pleasures, O Krishna. Of what use is the kingdom to us? Of what use are pleasures and even life itself? So he, <clears throat> he has this moment of, of a real kind of crisis of identity. You know, who am I? Who are these people? Who am I to go to war with these loved ones of mine? If we win, we don't really win because our victory is stained in their blood. And of course, if we lose, then what's the point in going to war at all? So he can see no way in which uh, the war will lead to a desirable outcome, to an outcome that could be wanted, that could be valued. So he falls from his chariot. He literally starts to disrobe himself of his warrior identity. He throws down his bow and arrows. <clears throat> he falls to his knees and he bemoans this situation, his fate as a warrior to Krishna. And this begins a very long conversation between Krishna, his friend, and God, and Arjuna. <clears throat> now, uh, at the heart of Krishna's teachings is this concept of yoga. Uh, yoga has a deep tradition, uh, yoga is, has appeared for at least a few hundred years in Indian texts. Uh, and quite literally, what yoga means is a yoke, right? Just like a yoke that you would put on, um, you know, oxen or something like this. <clears throat> and just like a yoke, and the term yoga itself derives from this verb, Sanskrit verb, yuj, which means to bind or to join. And these two terms are etymologically related. Sanskrit and the English language are, are not so distant cousins in terms of the, the Indo-European language family. So just as one would yoke oxen in order to rein in the raw power of these animals and use it for uh, more refined purposes, more productive purposes, and to avoid kind of uh, destructive outcomes, so too uh, does yoga emerge as a kind of spiritual, for lack of a better word perhaps, a spiritual technology to rein in the senses, to discipline our attention, so that we're not just wandering around all the time, either quite literally with our bodies or even just in mind, but can focus that to specific tasks, tasks that are productive and can lead to um, <clears throat> you know, goals that are 
condoned by the community at large. So Krishna says uh, <clears throat> in a number of places between the first chapter and the tenth chapter, he gives a number of teachings about yoga and he's disclosing to Arjuna the, the, subtle, uh, the subtleties of this doctrine of yoga. So here he says, when one directs the mind to a single point, actions of the senses and thoughts controlled, sitting oneself on the seat, one should join to yoga in order to purify the self. Okay, so the idea is that there's a certain purification of our, not just our base desires, but any desires, that, uh, any desires that are gain-seeking, that would have us become attached to uh, outcomes of a particular action. Okay, uh, and so here, you know, on the bottom left, we see someone who's just overwhelmed with distraction. You know, she ideally she practices some yoga, and then at the end or beginning of her practice, you know, takes her seat. And this seated meditation posture was kind of the, the bread and butter of yoga. It was only through you know, many hundreds of years that they developed a wide array of um, asanas or physical postures to complement this seated posture practice. Here's another side of, <coughs> of yoga, yoga discipline. And it involves disciplining the senses. And one example that's often given is that of a turtle who pulls in its limbs. Krishna says, when a person draws in the senses from the sense objects in every sphere, like a tortoise pulls in, it limb, pulls in its limbs, that one's wisdom stands firm. <clears throat> Yoga also involves equanimity, being equanimous in the midst of extreme situations, extreme pleasures, extreme pains. Yet again, uh, in chapter 6, Krishna says, the practitioner of yoga who is content with discernment and wisdom, unmoving with senses conquered, to whom a lump of clay, a stone, and a piece of gold are the same, that one is said to be joined to yoga. Again, we see this term joined or being yoked. Right? You reign in the senses in order to yoke your attention to objects of your own desire. <clears throat> uh, this yoking or this joining of the senses to objects of your own conscious intention involves freedom from attachment. Right? You know your senses are not dominated by objects, again, between which we may ordinarily vacillate objects of pleasure and pain. Elsewhere, Krishna says, when one has let go of the fruits of action, one joined to yoga gains full peace. The one not joined to yoga, clinging to the fruit or the outcome, is bound by actions of desire. Okay. <clears throat> it also leads to a certain self-knowledge. Uh, there's a very sophisticated uh, metaphysical theory of the self, something very much like a Christian soul that exists independently of the body, cannot be touched by uh, phenomenal events, and of course, Arjuna is about to engage in a war. So one of the things he is concerned about is how do I engage in war with these people without harming them? Well, Krishna says, the self, right, in our teachings and our yoga philosophy, right, the self is other than the body. And so he says, the one who perceives the self as a killer, the one who perceives the self as killed, neither of them know that this self does not kill, nor is it killed. The self is not born, nor does it ever die. So this self is called an Atman, uh, <clears throat> something in many ways very much like Alma, or a soul in, in uh, the Western tradition. It's not an active agent. It's rather just a pure kind of detached witness that passively observes the events of life going by. If Arjuna can just align with that, he can engage in his duty, and he won't be attached to the outcomes of his events. And also, the people who are being harmed on the battlefield, well, they're not really being harmed. It's only their bodies that are being harmed, but not their soul, not this pure self. <clears throat> Another feature of this, of course, is action. Yoga is a category of action. And this is Krishna's abiding concern throughout this conversation with the Gita. Yes, he's giving him teachings on yoga, but he's obviously not, you know, he's not training him to become a yoga teacher or practitioner or something like this. Arjuna must perform his dharma, his duty. Okay. And yoga is a way of performing your actions, performing your dharmic duties, but not being attached to the outcomes of those, of those duties. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so you can read this at your leisure, but the key line here is at the end. Join yourself to yoga. Again, bind yourself to yoga. Yoga is ease or skill in action. It's a particular kind of skill. It's not 
technical skill. It's a kind of, it's a skill of detachment. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this conversation ensues for, for quite a long time. Right? Chapter one up until the end of chapter 10 right? are really centered around teachings from Krishna to Arjuna. And presumably, you know, Arjuna is somewhat familiar with these teachings, but Krishna is really, again, he's kind of disclosing the subtleties of these teachings so that Arjuna can, on the one hand, perform his dharma. Krishna never gives Arjuna an out. But on the other hand, he can do it with a certain measure of detachment. And what happens through these various chapters, particularly up to chapter 10, is Arjuna begins to regain his confidence in his role as a warrior and in the actions that he must perform. And <clears throat> interestingly, what Krishna is also doing at the same time is not only is he motivating Arjuna to perform his dharma, his duty, but he's also kind of coaxing out of Arjuna a desire to, um, to learn about certain religious and philosophical truths. Right? <clears throat> and he does so with a kind of a game of cat and mouse. Right? He gives them certain explanations, but they elicit further questioning. And eventually gets to the end of chapter 10. And this is the final chapter, or the final verse of chapter 10. And Krishna says, but what Arjuna is the purpose of all of these questions? Right? <clears throat> I stand holding up this entire world with only a small part of myself. What he's really saying is, I have much more to tell you, Arjuna, much more to share with you. Don't you really want to know? What are you really asking all these questions for? And Arjuna bites, right? He takes the bait. Beginning of chapter 11, he says, with your words, my confusion is gone. Now I want to see your lordly form. Master, Lord of Yoga, if you think I am able to see this, then show yourself to me, you who are the imperishable one. Okay, so up to this point, Arjuna only knows Krishna as Krishna. Right? He has, incl there's inklings that Krishna is Vishnu, is an incarnation of God, but he has never had a direct experience of this. And in many ways, Krishna is kind of setting Arjuna up for this moment. And so he asks Krishna, he says, Krishna, show me your true form. Show me Vishnu. So this is what happens, chapter 11. Right after this request, Krishna says, behold, Arjuna, my forms, hundreds and thousands divine, varied in color and shape, Behold the Adityas and Vasus, these are different celestial beings. Behold today the entire world of the moving and unmoving, standing in unity here in my body, and behold whatever else you want to see. Arjuna describes what he sees. I behold you, Krishna, as a mass of splendor, difficult to look upon, <laughs> Radiant as a sun and glowing fire, immeasurable. I behold you who are without beginning, middle, and end, of boundless power with innumerable arms, the moon and sun in your eyes, your mouth a glowing fire, burning this universe with your radiance. <clears throat> so this is Krishna's theophany. And similar to other traditions and <clears throat> uh, other religious traditions, it's, um, there's a certain serenity to it, at least up to this point. It's powerful, it's beautiful, right? it fills Arjuna with that same power and splendor. <clears throat> but what's interesting is that <clears throat> the depictions of this event in chapter 11, and I, I, I looked all over the internet to find depictions of a different type. They display, they convey this power the grace, the beauty of Krishna, or rather Vishnu. <clears throat> but there's something that's missing from these images, a description in the text that these images do not convey. And it's this here. Arjuna continues. The worlds tremble, and so do I. I know not the directions of the sky, and I find no refuge. Be gracious, O Lord of God, <clears throat> Lord of God's abode of the world. And those sons of Dhritarashtra, all of them together with the hosts of kings, 
and likewise Bhishma, Drona, these are teachers of Arjuna, and also Karna, together with our chief warriors also. They are all rushing to enter your mouths of dreadful tusks. Some of them are seen caught between your teeth, their heads crushed, just as moths with great speed enter into the flaming fire and perish there. So also these creatures with great speed enter your mouths to meet destruction. You lick up and devour with flaming mouths entire worlds from every side. Your terrible light rays fill the entire world with radiance and scorch it. There's nothing like this is conveyed in this imagery. <clears throat> and this is an interesting, interesting feature of, of much religious art, or at least popular religious art, is that uh, much religious art, or again, popular religious art, there's a tendency to downplay the terror of the divine and to really focus on, you know, again, the grace, the warmth, the, um, <clears throat> the power, the comfort of knowing the divine. But here, now again, none of that is conveyed, right? We see Arjuna on his, on his knees, right? A position of piety, right? He's overwhelmed by the beauty and the sublimity of the divine, but we don't find the terror. <clears throat> this might be an image that better conveys uh, what Arjuna is experiencing. Okay, this, of course, is Goya's Saturn devouring his son. Okay, according to the story behind this painting, Saturn fears that one of his sons is going to overthrow Saturn. Right? And so he devours right, this, his defenseless son. <clears throat> well, this is, in many ways, what Krishna is doing, or at least one way of reading the theophany. Right? Krishna devours right, Arjuna's brothers not just his enemies, but his brothers, his teachers, his uncles, and his loved ones. Now, what's also very interesting is that <clears throat> Krishna is very accurately describing or foretelling what is going to happen in the remaining chapters of the Mahabharata. All of these events, of course, not literally, but all of these events will come true. Everyone dies, and everybody cheats. Arjuna cheats, his brothers cheat. At times, they are made out to be the villains. And his rival cousins are made out to be the, these tragic heroes. <clears throat> so Krishna is very accurately right, predicting and showing very plainly to Arjuna what is going to happen in the war. <clears throat> One person, Robert Oppenheimer, okay, of course the, the physicist who worked on the, uh, the Manhattan Project. This is in an interview in 1945 just after he's seen, uh, <clears throat> the, I, think, I believe it's the first explosion, test explosion, in the deserts of the Southwest. And he makes a very interesting reference to the Bhagavad Gita. He says, we knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. <clears throat> of all people, right, <clears throat> it's an American right, who really captures in many ways what gets hidden in many interpretations of the Gita. And meant much commentarial literature both in India and in the West, really downplays the significance of this event. The fact that Arjuna has not only one crisis of identity and action, but he has a second crisis in chapter 11, which is really the crux, in many ways, the crux of the Gita. Um, <clears throat> an interesting fact is that uh, many people, when they study the Gita, or when they teach the Gita, and my, in fact, I've been doing this myself just in my intro to Asian philosophies class, just for lack of time, we stop here. And we don't read the remaining cha chapters. In fact, Dan, Dan Shah at Pike Speed Community College and CC was also telling me that when he teaches this, the Gita, he stops at chapter 11, seeing this as the culmination of the Gita, and it's effectively over. And much scholarship, much of the scholarship on the Gita not only downplays the significance of this event, but gives very little attention to chapters 12 through 18. 
Uh, this is problematic for a number of reasons. One, the Gita is not just a text about uh, religious enlightenment or salvation. It's an ethical text. And so the issue is, how does Krishna get Arjuna to come back and assume, take on his body, take on his role after, he, after he's stripped away the empirical support of his identity? <clears throat> What's also particularly perplexing is if Krishna has spent chapters 2 through 10 getting Arjuna to regain his confidence to take up his dharma, to take up his duty, and this is his number one abiding concern, Arjuna must perform his duty then why, with the theophany, why would he reenact Arjuna's trauma in chapter 1? Why would he disclose to him in very fine detail all of the terrifying events that are going to happen in the war that's to come? Why not just show him the power and the splendor of Vishnu, but lie to him and say, everything's going to be fine, you guys will win, or you know, something along these lines? What is his rationale? in doing this. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> his rationale is going to have something to do with this concept of yoga, okay, which I talked about earlier. <clears throat> Krishna uh, gives us not only yoga in general, but he gives us three different kinds of yogas. Okay? Of these is karma yoga. It's called the path of ritual action. This goes back to the early Vedic texts. And they have to do with performing sacrificial, excuse me, <clears throat> sacrificial rituals where the participants um, kind of take up ritual identities. And then these ritual identities become templates for how you are to perform in social life. That what you are doing, what you're performing, are not personal intentions and desires, and then reaping the benefits of those personal acts. Rather, what you are is an instrument of ritual roles. And since you are an instrument of the ritual, the consequences of your actions are really consequences of the ritual, not your own. <clears throat> uh, and karma yoga is it's action-centered. It's also a way of getting Arjuna to not be so attached to the consequences of his actions. Another yoga is called jnana yoga. This term jnana is cognate with gnosis. And jnana yoga is something like a path of Gnostic realization. We talked, I talked earlier about this Atman, this pure metaphysical self. And this path of Jnana Yoga is really a path of studying scripture, sacred Hindu scripture, specifically the Upanishads. Um, <clears throat> and through this, realizing that the body is really just uh, kind of a shell of the self, and that uh, when we can, if we can let go of, we can detach from the body its desires, we can align ourselves with this pure metaphysical self and thereby just allow the body to kind of run its course, to do its own thing. And we're really just along for the ride, witnessing events in the world. <clears throat> and the third main yoga is bhakti yoga. Bhakti is the path of devotion. And <clears throat> some of the key features of this path of devotion. First of all, it's universal. It's open to all. It's very democratic. Uh, rich or poor, educated or illiterate, this was open to all people. Uh, it does not involve theoretical meditation or study of scripture. There's no single fixed form of worship. It's very uh, diverse. It embraces plurality. Uh, and it takes all actions, or it rather encourages that one perform their actions as offerings to the divine. Right? Uh, and this, in this case, the divine is, of course, Krishna. So Krishna tells Arjuna, and this is just before the theophany, he says, I am the same in all, in all beings, Arjuna, but those who honor me with devotion are within me, and I am also in them. With your mind on me, be devoted to me, sacrifice to me, and bow with reverence to me. Joined in this way, with me as the highest goal, you will come to me alone. <clears throat> now another key feature of this path of devotion is that it requires something like faith. And the term for this in Sanskrit is shraddha. Okay, this Sanskrit term shraddha, very often translated as faith or trust. <clears throat> so Krishna says at two different points, he says to Arjuna, there is no pleasure for the doubting self, not in this world, nor in the world beyond. But if one desires to worship 
any honored form with shraddha, I will grant to that person trust that is immovable. Right? So <clears throat> through, through Krishna's grace, Arjuna becomes saved. Right? His actions uh, are not his actions, they're Krishna's actions, because Krishna lives through all people. Krishna is Vishnu. And the consequences, Krishna will bear the burden of those consequences. Arjuna need not worry about that. But of course, Arjuna must give him faith, or something like faith, shraddha. There's an interesting correlative in the, in the Christian tradition. Perhaps one of the most famous passages on faith and other Christian virtues from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, where Paul writes, for there are these three things that endure, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love, agape. I'll say more about this agape in just a moment. Now, <clears throat> because literature, as I mentioned earlier, the commentarial literature on the Gita is, really focuses on the early chapters in the Theophany, not the post-Theophany chapters, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot to go on in making sense of Krishna's rationale. Like, why does he do this? Uh, because one, that situation is really covered up in many ways. And two, again, the dearth of literature on the post-theophany literature, uh, post-theophany chapters. So what I'm trying to do philosophically in this, in this uh, presentation and some of my work is to respond to this seemingly perplexing situation. Why would Krishna do such a thing if he wants Arjuna to perform his dharma? And what, if anything, does this have to do with bhakti yoga? Bhakti yoga being the yoga of those three yogas that really gets emphasized in the final six chapters of the Gita. And the person I'm going to look to is Nietzsche. Right? <clears throat> now again, this might seem like an odd move. Nietzsche is the most, one of the most famous atheists right, in the Western tradition, famously declaring that God is dead. And he also doesn't have much regard for Christian virtues like faith. <clears throat> Nonetheless, <clears throat> Nietzsche has some very interesting things to say about Amor Fati. <clears throat> Amor Fati. And there's a very ambiguous passage in some of Nietzsche's writings uh, from the gay science. It's a very ambiguous passage about what exactly Nietzsche means by Amor Fati. And Nietzsche writes, I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in things. Then I shall be one of those who make things beautiful. Amor fati, let that be my love henceforth. Someday I wish to be only a yes-sayer. <clears throat> Interestingly, this call to Amor fati, this is one of the, arguably, one of the major themes in Nietzsche's writings. And in his own personal life, it's something that he had a, a, a deeply personal um, struggle with, a deeply personal struggle to realize. And of course, Nietzsche recognizes that this is a very tall order, this Amor Fati, because one's fate is not always agreeable. <clears throat> it's not always easy to love our fate be pre precisely because it's not always something beautiful. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in clarifying what Nietzsche means by Amor Fati, his understanding of Amor Fati, and then relating this back to the Gita. What I'd like to do is I'm, I'm following the lead of a Nietzsche scholar, Beatrice Hanpail, and she tries to disambiguate this phrase in the quote I just read. What does it mean to see as beautiful <clears throat> what is necessary in things? And she approaches this phrase, she tries to unpack this phrase by looking at Nietzschean amor fati in terms of two very well-known models of love in Western philosophy, eros and agape. <clears throat> the erotic way of interpreting this passage would be something along these lines. If one loves one's fate erotically, right? if one takes a kind of quasi-platonic erotic approach to amor fati, then objects are loved in proportion to their beauty or perceived value, Fate is a potentially repellent object. Therefore, let us learn to discern that which is beautiful in our reality, apart from that which is deformed, so that what is necessary 
progressively ceases to repel us by virtue of our having learned to value it differently. In order to erotically love fate, we must make things beautiful by willing into existence that which is beautiful and eliminating that which is repugnant, thereby helping us to make fates more lovable. In other words, to love our fates uh, on this model means to create a world that's beautiful, that's valuable, and hence more worthwhile loving. Why? <clears throat> um, right. Now, there's a problem with this model that Han Pyle, uh, <clears throat> Beatrice Han Pyle notes. She says that the main problem of Amor Fati is one of genesis. In other words, the main problem of Amor Fati is how love of fate can occur, to, uh, can be generated at all. Not one of providing certain conditions by means of which fate can justifiably, justifiably be found to be lovable. Right? Another, uh, for example, our fate would be lovable because it's more beautiful or more valuable than it was yesterday. In making this point, Han Pyle notes that the, follow, that the phrase, then I shall be one of those who make things beautiful, <clears throat> in this phrase, making things beautiful is a consequence of a fati, not a precondition for it. In other words, love of fate precedes the creation of things beautiful, not the other way around. Since the expression make things beautiful, not make beautiful things, refers to already existing things, then the erotic form of physical poesis or creation, whereby beautiful things get produced, this model cannot obtain. Now, for this reason, she then moves to entertain an agopic interpretation of this amor fati. <clears throat> the central feature of agopic love is that we bestow value on someone or something because we love them, regardless of the value previously attributed to that, to it. But recall that, interestingly, Nietzsche is this great atheist. He celebrates the achievements of the Greeks, harshly criticizes Orthodox Christianity. Well, <clears throat> wouldn't it seem odd that Nietzsche is taking, has an agopic understanding of amor fati, of love of fate, right? <clears throat> But there are, some, uh, there are some important points of contrast between a Christian agape and Nietzschean amor fati, and I may touch on some of those later. But for our concerns here, there are some deeply meaningful parallels. Not unlike agape, amor fati transforms the space between self and other by securing the autonomy of affective states, uh, or loving our objects apart from the objects. In other words, we love objects independently of how those objects stand to us. The object does not dictate our love to it, our love for the object. Amor fati involves a maturation of feeling, not a mere intensification or emotion or a rationalized reevaluation re of fate. <clears throat> okay, now, <clears throat> um, just a couple of slides and then I'll, I'll finish up here. What I'd like to do is to draw a couple parallels between this understanding of Nietzsche and Amor Fati and Bhakti Yoga. And then hopefully, hopefully through this, respond to this, this question of what is Krishna's rationale right, in disclosing his form in such a terrifying way to Arjuna. Well, for one, they both cultivate what Nietzsche calls a yes-saying pathos for life. Right? Krishna says, you will never be deluded again, son of Pandu, that's Arjuna, when you have learned this bhakti yoga. For by this you will see all beings without exception in yourself and in me. He who has faith in me, who is committed to it, whose senses are controlled, gains knowledge, and having obtained it, he quickly obtains, attains supreme peace. <clears throat> the point here is that Krishna gives body to the phenomenal world. He gives body to Arjuna's fate, to his circumstance by calling Arjuna to devote himself through this kind of loving bhakti to Krishna, Arjuna is not only saying yes to Krishna, he's also saying yes to his fate. <clears throat> Here's a second, a second feature. Bhakti yoga and amor fati cannot be willed. 
Krishna says, ever performing all actions, taking refuge in me by my grace, he reaches the internal, a perishable abode. Uh, Hear once more my supreme word, secret of all. You are greatly loved by me. The man who unmurmuring and with faith shall listen to it, he shall be released. He shall attain the radiant worlds of the perfect. <clears throat> Liberation through this bhakti yoga is not something that one wills per se. It rather comes to one uninvited. That through this shraddha, okay, whatever this is, maybe something along the lines of faith, Krishna bestows this grace, but it's not something that is, has a kind of cause-effect relation. And so, again, it's only something that can come to Arjuna from the outside, right, as if uninvited. <clears throat> Two more features that I'll point to, and hopefully this will make, at least make clear, uh, one way of responding to this situation in the theophany. <clears throat> Bhakti Yoga and Amor Fati do not recognize a distinction between faith and fact. Okay, I showed this quote earlier from Nietzsche. Faith means not wanting to know what is true. In the case of the Gita, this term shraddha, traditionally interpreted or translated as faith, may in fact mean something much, much closer to attentiveness. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and a number of, in the middle here, what we have is, uh, this is a mandala. And these mandalas such as these are used in tantric yogic meditation exercises. And the encounter of the participant with such a mandala is highly structured. It involves both uh, stages of visualization, where the participant brings the mandala into being through very regulated and very structured um, <clears throat> stages. And there's also devotional hymns that are being sung and performed. The goal of this is to bring the god into being through acts of imagination. The imagination in these tantric yogic traditions have a, has a constitutive function. The imagination constitutes reality. <clears throat> um, something very similar may be happening in the Gita. Of course, we don't have time to analyze the various passages, but there's a number of passages where Krishna takes body, he gives body to different gods in different situations. And what he's in many ways doing is he's helping Arjuna to imagine, to visualize various worlds to imagine what it is like to be in the midst of you know, these gods and these celestial beings and, and so on. And what he's doing through this is he's constructing a world. And in this respect, Krishna, as the god, is equally contingent upon Arjuna's acts of imagining as Arjuna, as the devotee, is contingent upon the existence of Vishnu as the god. But what's required through this is not something so much as faith, where a devotee is the contingent being and God is the absolute being. What it involves is a very refined attentiveness. Attentiveness, again, through acts of imagination, where worlds are brought into being. <clears throat> From this, we don't have uh, a gap between acts of faith and affirmations of fact, which you often have in Orthodox Christianity. Rather, acts of shraddha, or acts of bringing, again, bringing worlds into being. <clears throat> and this leads to a fourth and final point. <clears throat> Love of faith is a first person problem. That is, it's a problem for me, for my experience, my life, not something in the abstract. And its realization is a way of, is a way of life that must be lived. Uh, in perhaps his final comment on Amor Fati, Nietzsche writes, what is most intimate in me teaches, teaches me that everything that is necessary, viewed from above and interpreted in the direction of a superior economy, is also useful per se. One needs not only bear it, but love it. Amor Fati, this is the bottom of my nature. From the perspective of Amor Fati, life is lovable for its own sake, regardless of one's reasons for or against it. And the truth of this realization requires a performing of one's love. 
Amor Fati is to be reenacted again and again. Moreover, such love of fate requires us to love a potentially repellent object, as fate entails significant negativity for us. And this and the knowledge that our love will not modify our fate. Han Pyle, Han Pyle has a comment on this. And it may shed some light on this, hopefully, <clears throat> or may help to clarify this. She writes, the affirmation of Amor Fati is perhaps best described as a commitment to living our lives in the light of, the, of our deifying love. It does not operate by holding in front of us the prospect of a life without any disorder, irrationality, or pain. <clears throat> this would only replicate the dichotomous structure of ascetic ideals by contrasting implicitly our currently wretched condition with a happy ever after under the sway of an, an erotic amor fati. Its agopic transfiguration does not work by ignoring the darker, chaotic, and irrational sides of human existence. It does not diminish our pain, our aversion to pain, nor dispel the painful character of our more difficult experiences, yet through an existential transformation that makes us stronger and more profound. It somehow enables us to love these experiences as fated, and this in spite of the suffering they cause us. No justification or reasons are involved at all. We feel the pain that attaches to such experiences, but find ourselves able to love them nevertheless, without holding them as objections to life. <clears throat> Final comment here. In the case of bhakti yoga, devotion is also its own end. One does not undertake acts of devotion for any fruit or consequence that is going to emerge in the future. There is no separation between the act and the fruit, between the now and the then. The fruit is contained within the action. Acts of devotion, according to this tradition, are liberating <clears throat> because acts of devotion themselves are liberation. <clears throat> similar, to, similar to Nietzsche's uh, Amor Fati, Krishna attempts to effect within Arjuna a turn toward a superior economy of love. The teachings following the theophany describe how it is possible to achieve loving engagement with one's world through yogic devotion. More specifically, they suggest an important lesson that Krishna may be conveying to Arjuna. For Arjuna to love his fate with Arjuna, which Krishna has now again taken into his body and commanded to Arjuna to love. For Arjuna to do this, he must abandon the quest for conditions that might justify his love and instead love an object that entails significant negativity for him. Precisely for this reason, Krishna reveals to Arjuna all of the horrors that will transpire in the war. Arjuna must not only love a repellent fate, but do so with the knowledge that he cannot modify his fate. Only in this way can Arjuna learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary, thing, necessary in things and make things beautiful. Amor Fati's deifying love transfigures repellent, seemingly unlovable circumstances, but without altering or minimizing their most terrifying circumstances. And I'll close there.